Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with your hosts, Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, Amy Luby, and Carl Palachuk. Produced by and for the Small Biz Thoughts technology community. We're dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Mark your calendars and plan to be with us May 17th and 18th as we bring you the 2023 SMB Online Conference. Check us out at smbonlineconference.com. You'll find we have more than a dozen speakers and two days filled with presentations, plus a format that really works for online conferences. Save $100 by registering today at smbonlineconference.com. All right. Welcome back to the SMB Community Podcast. This is James Kernan of Kernan Consulting, and I'm here with two of my friends, uh, Carl Palachek and Amy Babinchek. How, how's everybody doing today? Two, two of a thousand. Two of a thousand. <laughs> We're doing, everybody doing, doing good? Yeah. Doing really well. You know, I don't know. This week, my schedule is absolutely insane, but um, I don't know why things tend to pile on certain days like this, but it happens. Today's that day for me. <laughs> the April, beginning of May have just been over the top, uh, insane, busy for me. So, but, you know, it's better than being bored. Well, yeah. you have a conference to prepare for. So, yes, you know, yes. putting on a conference, that's a big deal. SMB Online Conference, May 17th and 18th, and uh, would love to see all of you there. I think we have, uh, I don't know if we have 150 yet, but we're approaching 150 attendees. So it should be a great discussion and uh, you know, kind of a two-day extravaganza. I am looking forward to it and the virtual happy hour along with it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a bring your own. This is a BYOB happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember those parties. No, I'm looking forward to the conference. That's going to be exciting. Very good. So I, I wanted to talk about uh, something we put in the show notes, which is there's this research from Synchro. And while I want to link to the PDF and uh, make sure that everybody uh, sees it, I also want to give people, a, I don't know, a, a, a big grain of salt to take with them. The PDF, you know, you got to scroll down to the bottom and see this is 603 people. And the when you look at the demographics, you'll see instantly this is not representative of our industry. So this is representative of a very specific group of people, 60% of whom uh, are larger MSPs with 10 or more employees. Uh, furthermore, <laughs> It's almost humorous to me when I look at the stats for like, you know, individual people and how popular is their, you know, people said, oh, I listen to their YouTube, their their podcast and so forth. Some of the people with the most popular podcasts don't have podcasts. Some of the people with the most popular YouTube channels don't post anything on YouTube. And so it's sort of, it's like, it's a good lesson that people respond to the questions you ask and you say, oh, have you heard, you know, whatever, this person on YouTube, podcast, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, do you follow them on social media? Uh, people don't know where they get their news. It's like this big amorphous information web. So that's because we have too much news, right? We can't, yeah, can't keep it. It is overload. It's hard to keep it sorted. But you're right, you know, the legend here is YouTube, social, podcast, newsletter, speak live, purchased book. There's a lot of, there's there's a certain amount of bias in that, right? So I, if you don't, uh, if you don't have a book, you're probably not on the list at all, right? Well, and I haven't <laughs> looked to see if all of these people have a book. Some of them, the, the, the book section is not listed. So I don't know if that means they don't have a book or nobody remembers buying their book. You know. Well, you're listed there, and your book is only listed at five percent, which seems <laughs> uh, which seems ridiculously low compared to your other media options, right? Uh, People again, have heard from you on uh, speaking live or watch your YouTube videos, um, but only five percent of 
have purchased a book from you. It seems well, a little skewed. And I do have to say, I have one of the largest newsletters in the industry. Um, you know, so my anyway, yeah, I'm not complaining about my stats per se, but you know, the it, it's sort of just interesting that you ask people their perception and they give you an answer. And so one of my maxims for life is always uh, buyers are liars. You know, you ask them a question and they will tell you something and then you write it down and then people will say, oh, it's not scientific, but it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I believe that. I'm not sure it's interesting if it's not rigorous. Uh, you know, the margin of error on something with 600 uh, respondents is probably in the 12 to 15 percent. So that means all of these numbers are exactly identical. Mm -hmm. Well, what is Microsoft has 600,000 partners, and here we have a representation of 600 people who may or may not be in that partner group because <laughs> not everybody's a Microsoft partner. Right. So, uh, I mean, it's I, interesting I, to see where the slide here on where do the MSPs find community. I'm a little surprised, right? Number one is Facebook, number two is LinkedIn. Those not too surprising. You could, you know, put those somewhere in the top end. But the next one is Discord and then Reddit. And I, I'm a little surprised by, by that position. Mm -hmm. um, and then Slack, Mastodon, Telegram, and Circle. I didn't even know Circle still existed, but 6% of people find their community on Circle. I've never heard of Circle before this moment. So <laughs> I didn't know that it did exist. So. Um, it's one of those platforms that Google comes out with and then cancels. Oh, well, I see Google Plus is not on the list. Right. So, well, it, it is interesting because there is a number somewhere. I just don't know what it is. What, what I will tell you is if you're going to do, if you're going to work with Synchro, this is a good, probably a pretty good representation of their partners, their uh, exactly. partners, MSPs. Their community, sure. you know, yep, so. their community, that makes more sense. And some of the things, what they value in a resource. Okay, so I, I, I could make the argument that those, that's probably representative of something. Again, plus or minus X percent, but uh, something that's 43% on that list versus 14, I can, I can make an argument that there's a difference between those two. So... I also don't know if this was an open-ended question or what, but anyway, if you have comments or questions, what we'd like you to do is two things. One, go download that, read it, memorize it. And then two, uh, send us notes, send us comments. You can even go to the SMB Community Podcast and put in uh, an audio chat and um, you know maybe we'll put you on the podcast. You don't even have to say nice things about us. <laughs> But that would be preferred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want us to use it in an ad, just say, you may use the following in an advertisement. There you go. Yeah. But just don't say things like, I trust no one more than I trust these guys. All right. Let's stop talking about trust and MSPs and information. And we got to talk about parrots talking to each other on Zoom. Because that is so cool. <laughs> parrots are so social. And I always feel bad for the lone parrot at the pet store. Or even when I hear somebody say that they have a pet parrot. And I'm always like, just one? Because they're the most chattery social creatures on the planet, I think. So I can see where a parrot would love Zoom. Be like, I'm going to call up my parrot friends. We're all just sitting at home doing nothing <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> I wonder, excuse me, I us cut that out. I wonder which uh, parrots talk the most, because if you watch the video, some of these are parakeets. Like it's, it's just sort of all uh, <laughs> birds of different sizes, but most of the ones are the ones who have some kind of vocabulary, although they don't talk to each other the way they talk to us. Like they they skip the the human language and go to, you know, whatever, parrotees. Right. Well, parakeets, they do talk a lot, right? So um, my next door neighbor had children and they had a cage of parakeets 
And in the morning, they would take them out and set them on the front porch in the in the sun so they could enjoy some fresh air and sunshine, I guess. And oh my God, do they converse? <laughs> it is the constant chirping. It's, you know, in my area, we have sparrows that do the same thing, right? They gather in groups and they chitter chat to each other all day long. But, um, but yeah, I mean, parrots actually go through a thing where, you know, they get mentally ill if they can't be social. Hmm. It, I mean, they're, they're sort of humanoids that way, right? We get the same way. Right? Absolutely. So uh, maybe three miles down the road from me, there's a, a shop in Sacramento that all they sell is large birds, you know, so parakeets and, you know, these, these macaws and things like that. And uh, I've been in there just, be, just because I find them fascinating. And uh, they frequently have to separate birds. They like put them on separate sides of the building so that <laughs> they don't yell and scream and argue with each other all day long. So uh, I think it's very interesting. But others are like totally friends and so forth. So uh, anyway, this is this is cool technology. I want to talk about the the technology. So Zoom is obviously just one platform, but uh, can you see uh, kind of a, a like a parrot internet emerging? <laughs> I love they it. Get in this, they get to say, yes, I want to make a call. And then they get to choose who they want to call. And, you know, one of the cool pieces of the research is that those who placed more calls received more calls. And I'm like, oh, this sounds like Christmas cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, your parrot, if it can, if it can, you know, voice that it would like to call one of its friends, it could certainly voice to your um favorite i can't even say the word because there's one right behind me um system for ordering things off the internet <laughs> like she you know, i need I, she who she who shall not be named right you can see a parrot <laughs> like i need a i need a new beak scratcher <laughs> yeah i heard i heard there's some new water water holding technology out there. yeah well or hey who ordered 27 pounds of bird food <laughs> <laughs> Well, and what's next? So will there be a cat internet where they can all cat talk to each other? They would probably not. Dogs might. Yeah, cats would definitely not be in. You're not into that. They're like, you are, I don't know who you are, but you don't belong on my screen. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And this week, uh, I had a really exciting conversation with some old colleagues of mine that came from the Microsoft world in Southern California. So Justin Slagle and Matt uh, Sosman formed a company just this month called the Partner Masters, okay? And I'll, I'll describe what we talked about this way. If I ask all of you, what's the most confusing vendor that you work with or the most confusing partner portal that you log into and it opens 500 screens and I always seem to get lost and then my system locks up. It's Microsoft, right? It's Microsoft. There's uh, many of you are Microsoft partners. And if you want to uh, talk to some super smart guys that will make the experience so much better for you and make it more meaningful and get the most out of your Microsoft partnership, it's these guys at the Partner Masters. So really excited. Uh, they shared some great wisdom. Uh, please tune in for that. That's going to be awesome. All right. Hey, welcome back. This is James Kernan with Kernan Consulting back on the SMB Community Podcast. Uh, today, I am joined with two superstars. Really excited about today. Um, I've got uh, some former Microsoft uh, employees uh, that have a new business going, and we want to share a little bit of that and their idea with you today. But uh, on today's program, we've got Justin Slagle and Matt Sosman. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, James. Thanks for having us here. Excited to talk to you. Thank you, you James. Bet. You bet. Welcome. 
Welcome. All right, cool. So I've known you guys for a long time. You know, being in Southern California, you you uh, were two major resources that helped Microsoft partners, you know, really launch uh, their Microsoft practice and be successful. But let's go back in time a little bit. How were you two introduced uh, to each other? How, how long have you known each other? That's kind of a fun story, James. But uh, Matt, Matt and I, um, I guess we were kind of introduced. We're more thrown thrown to the wolves together uh, <laughs> back at Microsoft probably six or seven years ago. Uh, in fact, what happened was uh, I was I was working as a partner development manager at Microsoft and I got a ping on Teams uh, from someone on Matt's team who said, hey, all this growth that's happening at your partner, it's all because of my boy Matt at your account. And I was like, what are you talking about? I've been doing all kinds of things with this account causing a lot of the growth. <laughs> and so they wanted to take all the credit and uh, I was not having it. I didn't even know that they were actually working out there. So I wanted to punch this guy in the face and, uh, and I wanted to find out who he was. And then uh, we finally got together and, and uh, we actually quickly became best friends. So it was, it was kind of a fun story where it, 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 started, it started with a little chaos, but it's ended up really nicely. That's great. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you both are, are based in Southern California still. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yep. I'm in San Diego, and and Justin's just north of me up in Orange County. All right, super. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's where I ran into Justin at first, and that had to be almost you know 14, you know 14, 13, 14 years ago. Um, but because... I actually remember it, James. I re I remember you and I first met. Uh, I was trying to get involved with the IAMCP chapters. Mm -hmm. I just learned about it. I think it was back in 2008, 2008 or 2009. Yep. And there was a San Diego chapter, but there wasn't an Orange County chapter. And I, I had gone down to San Diego, which you were part of the chapter there. There was four or five of us locked up in a room. I was trying to figure out what you guys are doing. And then I was invited to, um, to, to start the Southern California chapter. But that's where we first met, our, our very first meeting. That's right. That's right. At the, at the Microsoft offices over there in La Jolla. I remember that. Yep, for the exactly. TT area. Cool. So, so let's uh, back in time a little bit. Obviously, you've been both in technology for a while, but what was the attraction? How did you get into, you know, technology, the technology industry? Was that always a hobby of yours, or did you get uh, just thrown in the fire like I did? Well, I think I think Matt's got a better story on this one. But for me, uh, I I was traveling a lot, so I was working for Nissan. I was going around to a bunch of auto shows and um, working beach volleyball tournaments and doing some different things. I I wanted to take a job where I didn't have to travel 300 days a year, okay. and so I just answered a answered an ad in the newspaper, uh, and and uh, that's how I got my job at Quick Start back in the day. Uh, so I started with them as an account executive, and um, the second year in, I was invited into the ownership team and, and got into the executive management. But uh, but for me, it was it was yeah, I was thrown, I was definitely thrown into it. Just I wanted a job that I didn't have to travel. That's great. How about you, Matt? Yeah, a, a little different. Um, I've been in technology my whole career, so uh, so uh, probably close to twenty five years now. But um, Worked all through uh, various companies. Sprint back when it was a company. Now it's T-Mobile. Uh, did some some work at BlackBerry, and then spent eleven years at Microsoft. And uh, you know, technology roles the the entire time at those three companies. And even before then, I've worked at some some smaller companies doing doing IT work. Uh, but for me, it's always been a passion, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, something I've always kind of enjoyed. It's almost like a hobby, right? I, I used to tell people, I I would do this stuff for free if I could. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's just something I really enjoy, and um, you know, for me, I just I like being a learner, and I think when you're in technology, you're always learning, and hey, it's fun. Yeah, that's uh, well said. Well said, Matt. I you kind of tapped into you know when when you're doing something that you love and something that you're passionate about, you know, it's not work. It's just it's fun, and yeah. uh, you know, I feel the same way about just helping business owners, you know, take their business up to the next level and become more successful. So I, I get that 100%. So really excited. Hey, tell us about your new business. Tell uh, tell everybody uh, a little bit more about your new business and how you guys came up with the idea. Yeah. So the new business is called the Partner Masters, and so as as we talk here, and, and James, you know us, but for anybody else listening, like. We are truly passionate about two things. One, Microsoft, mm -hmm. and two, the Microsoft partner community. 
um, you know, for, for those who don't know, like, like I, to talk about Microsoft passion, my son is named Maverick Bing. <laughs> wouldn't have my son if we weren't for the Microsoft benefits. And, uh, and we always want to remember that, but, um, uh, I, I, we're, we're not looking to start up a business to, to do anything with Amazon or do anything with Google or do anything with the other, any other big tech. Uh, but we are 100% focused on Microsoft and 100% focused on the partner community. Mm -hmm. Now, Microsoft's mission, for those who don't know it, the mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And what Matt and I were noticing over the years is that although Microsoft wants to, to do as much as possible with the partner organizations, there's just not enough manpower. And there's only, so they're restricted in such such way. So every year, the, the number of partners they can manage are less and less. So there's 400,000 total Microsoft partners in the world. There's about 100,000 of them transacting in the US, yet Microsoft manages less than 1,000, far less than 1,000 of those partners. So there's mm -hmm. over 99,000 partners out there who are raising their hands saying, hey, pick me, pick me. And Matt and I would continually hear from these partners and say, hey, can you help us on the side? Is there anything that you can do here to, to help us get... We, we just want to do more with Microsoft, but Microsoft is not able to, to help. And if you know the inside workings of Microsoft, you understand why. And, and the focus has to be somewhere with the limited number of people that they have. But we've always known, hey, there's, there's an opportunity for us. And so with, with you know, the, the, the opportunity presented itself to us, Matt and I have been kind of joking about it for probably four or five years. Hey, what if we created the Matt and Justin show? What if we went out and did this on our own? But we were thinking about different angles, but then this one finally hit us that, We've got to do something to help empower partners. Mm -hmm. um, we want to continue that mission of Microsoft, even though we're not working at Microsoft, we still want to continue with that mission, empower every person, every organization. Our part of that is empowering every partner organization. We want to be that, that, uh, that organization that can do that. Yep. Yep. And James, just to maybe build on that a little bit, uh, just in maybe some, some additional context for those out there who don't know us, um, during uh, Justin's entire time at Microsoft, he's worked in the partner organizations doing work with Microsoft partners. And then a majority of my time at Microsoft, uh, there's a few roles where I didn't work with partners, but majority of my time, I also worked with partners. Mm -hmm. And so just that combined experience, um, and we've, I mean, we've probably touched, you know, probably well over a thousand partners during that, you know, over a decade. And, you know, with that combined experience, we've learned a lot. And we've learned you know, what makes really good partners, what makes really not so good partners. Um, and then having worked at Microsoft and actually being on the inside, we really understand how Microsoft approaches partners and how those types of things work. And so, you know, all of that knowledge kind of contributed to, and as Justin, you know, put it, you know, hey, what if we do the Matt and Justin show? And what if we go out there and, and really empower these partners? And when we think about the Microsoft mission statement, it's to empower every individual and every organization on the planet to achieve more. We also want to look at that from a, a partner perspective and say, well, how can we go out there and empower these partners to achieve more? And, and not just achieve more at the Microsoft business, that's important, obviously, yeah. but how can we help them achieve more just in them running their business yeah. and being able to, to actually take advantage of how this amazing technology can help them you know, move their business faster and, and farther. So, yeah. so again, well, we're really yeah. passionate about it. Yeah, I've got lots of questions because I'm excited to kind of yeah. dig into this. So everybody understands. I get it because, you know, I work for some bigger organizations. We're big uh, Microsoft strategic partners, and we had dedicated employees to those partnerships. And, and why was because it was so complex and so challenging, but it's so important from a leadership and a business owner standpoint to understand all the resources that Microsoft has available, all the rebates, all the programs, and build your business plan around those programs and take advantage of them. That's how you grow. And that's more importantly, how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. And uh, I love you. You guys mentioned the IMACP. Uh, for those of you that aren't um, familiar with it, I think it's the International Association of Certified Microsoft Partners. There's chapters all around uh, the uh, North America, but it's um, it's so important because inside that local community, of, you think of them as competitors, you know, they're all your friends. They're all Microsoft partners, maybe with different expertises and skill sets than you have, but that's, you leverage things like that to grow your business. Uh, so I, I love what you guys are doing. So talk, talk a little bit more, give the audience some ideas of the services. How do you engage with a typical Microsoft partner? 
So what we do is we, we start with what we call a 90 day Microsoft partnership accelerator. So what we found, and, and in fact, we've, we're, we've changed our, changed our model a couple of times and, and we're, we really love what we've got here. Uh, but we always start with looking at partner center. We find that the, the, that is the heartbeat of the Microsoft partnership. Yeah. And we found that most partners, I mean, uh, 99 plus percent of partners are not aware of everything that's available to them in partner center and, mm -hmm. and what they could do with it. So we start with, we have a partner profitability executive on our team who's going through and will do an assessment of partner center and find out the things you're doing well and all the things that you could potentially improve upon. And we have a, a framework that we've built out that looks at, okay, what are you doing with your solution designations? Which ones should you have? Which ones do you have? How far away are you? And how can we help you achieve others? Well, how are you doing customer association? Most partners are not familiar with all the different ways that you should be associating partners through CPOR, Claiming Partner of Record, or PAL, Partner Admin Link, to get Microsoft visibility into the customers that you're actually working with. Mm -hmm. When should you do this? You should still do this, even if you have a, a CSP customer, you're selling and transacting a licensing through the Cloud Solution Provider Program, you still should be claiming all of those customers because it unlocks additional incentives for you with Microsoft. So mm -hmm. we, we start with this assessment and we show partners, hey, here's all the things that you may be leaving on the table. And then we create some objectives and key results along with some key, key performance indicators that we work on mutually to allow a partner to build a foundation with our team. So that's what's different about what we were doing at Microsoft and the partner organization, what we're able to do with the partner masters is that the, at Microsoft, we're only able to give some coaching and guidance to say, hey, here's how to do this. But we didn't have a lot of time. We had so many partners. We had so many priorities, so many internal calls. We would just say, OK, James, go do CPOR on all your clients. And then we'd hope that you did it and come back a few weeks later. What we can now do is because we can ask for access and we can have tenant access into your partner center domain. We can actually go in and do C4 claims for a partner. We can actually go in and help associate uh, individuals who have certifications. So there's a lot of things that we can now do that we weren't able to do in the past to really help accelerate those partners and build a very solid foundation, whether they want to continue after the 90 days with us or they want to continue on their own. Wow. Well, that's a, that's amazing. And, and I'm sure most of the people listening into the program are well aware of what Justin was just talking about, about the the vast wasteland inside the Microsoft portal. It's easy to get tripped up. Uh, I used to complain. It seemed like every link I clicked, it opened new windows. And by the end of my session, I had 5,000 windows open and my system would lock up. So um, it's it's <laughs> confusing just <laughs> navigating around. So it sounds exactly you. like my desktop most of the time, James. But I also <laughs> want to give Matt, I wanted to give Matt a second to talk about because yeah. it's part of the business is all on the technical side, right? Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll preface this and say that one thing that makes us different is we start with technical. So I was saying we start with a partner center assessment, but once we get through with the assessment and, and the way we help partners, it has to start with technical. Because if you go out and you sell something, but you don't know how to deliver it, you're going to fall flat every single time. So Matt, why don't you talk about how you go out and your team helps enable our partners on the technical side? Yeah. You, you know, being a technologist, James, um, I've and, and having worked at Microsoft for well over a decade, I, I understand that Microsoft has all sorts of products and services. And, and frankly, a lot of them, people may have never even heard about. I mean, there's that many that's out there that exist. And what's really interesting is when you, when you look at the technology that's, that's available for Microsoft, it's really a platform that you can build on. And as a partner, that platform can really help you launch into new markets. It can help you land different types of customers and different types of industries, help you develop new solutions. And you know, maybe just to put it bluntly, it can help you make more money and make mm -hmm. more revenue as a company, right? And so, so my passion is, and, and really what fuels me is how can I work with Microsoft partners, whether it's an MSP or a systems integrator or a independent software vendor, how can I work with you to help you understand how this technology can, can move your business forward, both mm -hmm. in terms of how you use it internally, but also how you sell it to customers and how you help customers take advantage of it. And so the other side of this is not only just you know, managing partner center and managing partner operations and, and helping that partner be successful from that perspective, but it's also helping them be successful with the technology. And how do we help them you know, take advantage of it so that they can understand what are the new types of 
customer problems and challenges that can be solved with the technology, and then going out there and building solution offerings, going mm -hmm. out there and building intellectual property that, that differentiates you from other Microsoft partners, um, building solutions that also helps you differentiate when Microsoft looks at you and how you want to be viewed. Um, and then taking that a step further and making sure that you have the, the technical chops, if you will, to go out there and deliver these and actually work with customers to be able to help them take advantage of the technology. So, so my team at the Partner Masters is really focused on that technical enablement piece and, and making sure that those, those technical solutions are, are developed in such a way that differentiates you, but also allows you to go out there and, and deploy those at scale and help you move your business forward, but most importantly, help you move your customer's business forward using that technology. And I've seen you know, many times over the years with, with, with Microsoft partners of all shapes and sizes where they don't fully take advantage of that. And then they come back to me and say, you know, I, I, I don't like my Microsoft partnership. And when you start to really, really dig into it, I start to understand and, and hear from them that they're not really learning about the new technology. They're not really taking advantage of what these new capabilities that Microsoft has made available. And again, it's, it's all out there for anybody to use. It's just a matter of how do you take advantage of that? So that's kind of my focus on the business uh, on my mm -hmm. side is that technical arm mm -hmm. and helping that become a reality. For these parts. Well, it's uh, both parts are super important, you know, because it sounds like the more the assessment is the front end coaching and advice of, of how to engage in these programs. But unless you can deliver it, then you're no better off, right? So you do need, and I know, I know you guys have known both of you for a long time. You know thousands of super uh, talented technical people. So I'm kind of excited. So let's talk one more question, I guess, about the the delivery arm, Matt. How how do you connect those resources to some smaller Microsoft partner that has a a project that maybe they don't have the skill set for, uh, but they have an opportunity? Do do you connect them with someone that has those capabilities or do, do you have your team or kind of a combination of both? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think it's gonna depend on, on you know, who that, that partner is in terms of um, you know, where they are at in their journey, right? Yeah. Um, if they have the, the desire and they have the ability, uh, then it might be enabling their current delivery team by training them and bringing them up to speed and, and building those new technical chops, as I, I, as I put it, and enabling them to go out and do it themselves. So that might be one approach. Mm -hmm. um, the other approach might be, we bring in resources from our, our vast network, right? Um, mm -hmm. Our network of, of, of professionals you know, across the globe that have deep expertise in specific areas. So for example, um, if you're a Microsoft partner and you have an opportunity to do uh, data and AI with your clients, um, but you don't necessarily have a data and AI practice and you don't really want to invest in that, then there are specialists that we can bring in that can help you go and deliver those data and AI solutions, you know, with your clients, yeah. um, and and really, you know, kind of work on on your paper, if you will, to to you know empower you and, and make sure the customer sees you as as a as a specialist. But we we've got a vast network of people that can come in and help, or we could also empower you and enable you to go do it yourself. So it kind of depends on where you're at in the journey. Um, but I think all of it starts with you know, understanding what's available and then figuring out where do you want to go as a business, right? Like you can't do it all. It's just, it's just too much and you have to specialize. So it, it starts with understanding where, what path do we want to go down? Where do we want to play? And then we build out a plan together to go and and do that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. So uh, anyway, I, I have a, a million questions in my head, Matt, that I want to uh, ask you, but we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to zip it and ask a couple other big picture questions, but uh, that's amazing on the delivery side. I get tons of questions specifically around the educational piece. You know, how do I get this certification or how do I find someone with this certification? And we want to build this practice area out. And I'm a huge fan of encouraging people to uh, create their own destiny in their business and develop uh, that core competency. And, but in order to get there, typically you've got to outsource or work with someone that has that expertise uh, as you develop those opportunities. To me, they, they kind of go hand in hand. So um, anyway, uh, that's exciting. So um, uh, we talked a little bit about the normal engagement. You guys have the 90-day assessment. How much of a business owner's time would, would that require over that 90 days? What's the frequency that you guys meet with and um, I'm trying to let the listeners have an understanding of 
uh, from a time standpoint, what does the onboarding look like in, in your engagement? How much time would be needed? It certainly ramps up over time, James. So it, it starts off as we're doing the actual partner center assessment. There's not a lot of time needed as, as we're looking through and we're figuring out, okay, where are the opportunities that we see that we should work together? Okay. Once we get through the assessment phase, which is typically about a week to two weeks, depending on how much is in, in or not in partner center, uh, we meet with the partners on a regular basis to decide, okay, what are the objectives that we want to achieve? What are the resources that we want to bring in? It might be business coaching. It might be sales coaching. It might be some marketing initiatives, and it could be technical. Uh, it could also be work that we're doing on behalf. And so if we're doing a lot of work on behalf, maybe there's not as much required, but it really depends upon the, the mutual agreement of how much work the partner wants to do themselves versus how much work they'd like for us to take on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Excellent. That's uh, that's exciting. So so how how do how do people engage with you? How would they get in touch with you guys? I think the easiest thing is uh, to go to our website. Right now we are on a wait list, uh, but our our website, which is thepartnermasters.com, uh, we'll take them. They can fill out a form. Uh, they can also reach out to us at sales at thepartnermasters.com. Uh, we do have a full team that are responding to our wait list and any customer inquiries that come in and talk through what our program is. And help uh, help with timelines of when we when we have availability of where we could potentially start. That's awesome. That's awesome. Any anything else that you guys want to share uh, before we wrap up today? Any words of wisdom? Like I think uh, my my words of wisdom are, Microsoft does not have to be complicated. I think mm -hmm. that's what, we, what we've learned, and even our tagline is Microsoft partnerships with no assembly required. We know this Microsoft partnership engine inside and out from technical operations, sales, marketing. There are a lot of partners out there who are just lost and they just need a little bit of help. And what we've seen with every partner that we've engaged with is there is a massive amount of opportunity. I think everybody agrees with that, right? There's a massive amount of opportunity with Microsoft. It's just how do I take advantage of it? Yeah, That's what we're here for. And that's what we love to engage with your listeners on. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I guess in addition to that, I mean, for me, just kind of being the technical guy is, um, and as I mentioned earlier in the call, you know, if, if you're in the technology industry, you got to like change and you got to be willing to adapt. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think kind of my words of wisdom for, for anybody out there listening is, you know, Microsoft is always changing. I don't have to tell you that. You, you've noticed that. Um, but be willing to adapt to those changes. Every year there's new programs, there's new announcements, there's obviously new technology. And if you continue continuously adapt to that and embrace that change, you're going to have a great partnership and it's going to move your business forward. Yeah, no, that's, that's exciting. I mean, the majority of, of MSPs and tech firms in general, the majority have five or less employees. So they are the little guys that historically may have been neglected from, from Microsoft because that's not where the run rate business is. So I, I get that, but I wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of those business owners, because I too have a heart for the small business owner. I want to help people, uh, whatever they, uh, whatever their plan for success is, I just want to help people get there. And I really uh, am excited about what you guys put together. I think it's super smart. I think you guys are going to just blow up and, and do fantastic. So uh, thank you uh, from all the listeners uh, for doing what you're doing. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys will get several calls. Thanks, James. We appreciate the time. All right. Thanks, you James. All right. Well, we're signing off from the SMB Community Podcast. Thanks for listening in. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Other tidbits in the news, I, I do have to say that the AI chat, which we don't even have to talk about this week, but it just seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's never going to, going to go away. Like, I, I, it's easy to predict it shall dominate the next five years and maybe 10. Yeah. Well, I hope it moves beyond chat. Right. I'm actually enjoying the Microsoft's co-pilot implementation of it because it's not chat focused. It's, you know, you need to search something, you need to find something, just ask it to do the thing for you. Right? More of a more of a tool than just a, 
a chat, you know, call and response kind of thing. I feel like this is, you know, somebody's just invented the first automobile and it's sort of a one cylinder putting down the road and someday it's going to be a really useful tool but right now it's just kind of put put putting down the road well that's true of all new things um but I, what's intriguing to me is that this has got to the point very quickly where people eh, maybe they don't understand it but it, it's become usable enough for them that they're uh grabbing onto it. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of offshoots of it very quickly. I will say it's one of the easiest things to fake right now. A lot of new technology is easy to fake. Mm -hmm. um, in the early 90s, literally the day after the, uh, uh, the World Wide Web was introduced, somebody came to me and said, can you help me build this system? And I won't say the brand name, but it's a system to create a a nationwide system of putting in golf reservations at golf clubs. And basically you could put in any golf club you wanted and when you wanted reservations and you click a button and then it says, oh, please wait. <laughs> and then somebody at their office calls the golf club, asks if they can make a reservation at this club at that time. And when they say yes, they get a re uh, number for them or, or whatever. And then they go back and say, you know, basically in chat, uh, yes, we've made this reservation and da, 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 da. And then they charge them money for it. So they hadn't yet developed the technology. They knew they would develop the technology, but it was all smoke and mirrors at the beginning. And so <laughs> you, you could totally see, uh, you know, 10,000 people uh, in a call center just typing into the thing, pretending to be chatbots. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think the thing that AI has exposed is that internet search was not working for people. Mm -hmm. It was the instant that an AI became available, people just started asking it for stuff. Well, it has certainly improved Bing's uh, share of the market almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And that will lead to an increase in their share of ad revenue as well. So uh you know i mean google will be right behind them and blah 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 but uh having seen one chink in the armor uh i think google's complete dominance uh is over as of uh, spring 2023 <laughs> yeah absolutely <clears throat> i mean you can't help but pick up a paper and and see multiple headlines talking about uh, the technology so <clears throat> and what's interesting to me is it's such a powerful tool but the media is really spinning it all in a negative sense, or most of what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, it's, you know, bad, 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 don't do this and stay away from that. And, you know, it's such a powerful tool for us. So. But uh, so I wrote a blog post about mm -hmm. six personalities who respond to AI. And I did point out there are people who are embracing it in a good way. You mm -hmm. know, the, there's one story that I tell of this teacher that said, look, this is kind of like a calculator. You, you math teachers can't say no calculators in the classroom. That's a very 1973 sort of thing, right? What you have to say is this is a tool. So now we have to teach students how to use it. So what she exactly. did is present, you know, the, a book. We're all going to read this book. And then we're going to ask as a group, ask AI to write a uh, summary of the book or, you know, an analysis of the most important part of the book. Great. Now we're going to distribute that to all the students and say, okay, now critique what ChatGPT came up with, right? And that teaches them, okay, the weaknesses of the tool, the strengths of the tool, where it goes sideways, and so forth. Uh, and again, the tool will get better, but uh, the, the teachers who will succeed in the next 10 years are the ones who embrace it, not the ones who say, oh my God, my job is over. <laughs> I, I love how simplistic you frame that. It's just a tool, you know, it is. It is just a tool. You could use it for good. You could use it for bad, but you need to learn how to use it. And I, I think of it in a positive way. So, um, you know, that's why I don't read the newspaper or watch the news anymore, uh, just because everybody has their own spin on it. But uh, it, it certainly helping my business. I'll just word it that way. <clears throat> so... Well, I am simplistic, so it's, it's kind, of, <laughs> kind of my brand. I meant that in the most professional and complimentary way possible, Carl. <laughs> All right. 
Well, hey, thanks for tuning in to the SMB Community Podcast today. Um, I was enlightened. I learned a lot today, actually. Um, but uh, cool, cool report uh, from our friends at Synchro and a good discussion about the topic. So, uh, Amy, Carl, thanks for being here today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the SMB Community Podcast. If you found this useful, interesting, or fun, please subscribe, share with your friends, and give us a thumbs up on your favorite social media. Please check out the show notes at smbcommunitypodcast.com and give us your feedback.